Hello, and welcome to Music Industry 360, the podcast brought to you by Symphonic Distribution. I'm your host, Randall Foster, and I am Chief Creative Officer at Symphonic, and it is my pleasure today to talk about music industry banking with one of the greatest, best bankers I know, and, and a lovely human to boot. Please welcome our guest, SVP of Music and Entertainment Banking at Studio Bank, Miss Carrie Barnhart. Carrie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be with you today. Well, and I'm I'm excited to have you here because I music banking is something that I only realized really existed once I had moved into the music publishing world. But I think music banking is is such a in the bankers and the in the organizations we work with on the financial side are such an integral part of this industry that I think it's going to be really really great to explore this subject with you. So real quickly, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? How'd you get into banking, et cetera? Um, well, I am from a teeny tiny town in Southeast Missouri called Charleston, Missouri. Um, you know, I honestly, I always tell people, I don't know how I thought, you know, the music that I heard on the radio. I worked at a CD store from the time I was 16 until I graduated college when I was home from, uh, from school and, you know, was very familiar, of course, with the, the CDs and the, the different aspects from that perspective. But I don't know if I really thought much about how they actually came to be or the business side of things until I moved to Nashville. Um, and I just had an opportunity uh, to work at a bank. I worked at Fifth Third Bank when they first were starting their music division. And at the time, just thought I was going to be working in the actual banking center um, on the retail side in order to help support uh, the clients that just came into the bank, but also help support the, the newly started music division. And about a year or so in, they were looking to expand the team. And I had made friends with the, the different bankers that were dedicated to the music space. And they had encouraged me to put in for the job and I actually got it. And so at that point, it was one of those situations that it's like, okay, I've got the job, now what? And the now what for me was, now I have to learn about the music industry and the music business side of things. And so I was very blessed with some amazing mentors who took a vested interest in me and my career and wanted to see me succeed. They met with me on Friday mornings at 7 a.m. at the Pancake Pantry, and one of them, his name is Kevin Lamb. Uh, he would teach me all things music business. I got my first and only uh, music publishing contract where he went through the different pieces of what the contract looked like just so that I could understand better of how to serve my clients and what it was that they were dealing with on a daily basis. Uh, um, and I've been doing it now for almost 13 years. So i Worked at Fifth Third for about six and a half years, and then I left, my entire team left and went to Regions Bank, uh, which is a wonderful bank in their music division, and was there for about five and a half years until I left and went to Studio Bank, um, which is where I am now. It's a wonderful boutique bank that was created to empower creatives, and it really is home, and I'm so thankful to be able to be a part of it and, um, you know, just watch people achieve their dreams. That's why I do what I do on a daily basis. That's awesome. So you you were kind of like the dog that finally caught the car on the <laughs> getting to banking and, oh, God, I've got to learn it now. Yes, yes, absolutely. My mom had to pick, talk me out of the car to attend events on many, many occasions. But it's, a you know, that team you were with, and I, I'm privileged to actually know them, um, you all did so much good at, at every organization you were at. And, and I was, I was just tickled pink when you had the opportunity to go to studio, because of course we have a lot of friends at studio and, um, and with a name like studio, of course you are empowering creators. <laughs> you can't call a bank studio bank and not be affiliated with the studios in some way, shape or form. What, um, so your place, I'm sure you see a million different scenarios as an entertainment banker to how the bank becomes really a partner with the creators. Um, 
you know, from everything at the macro level, from the large catalog acquisitions we always hear about, um, what other parts of of the industry outside of the big multi million dollar acquisition side of things um, do you see banking and especially your role working for a boutique white glove community? really community bank for the creative community. Um, what other areas do you guys work in most with regards to your interactions with your clients? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. So, I mean, the, the great thing about what I do is we work with all facets of the music industry. So I work with emerging artists and songwriters. I, I work with ones who, you know, who are newer to town and are, you know, in conversations with publishing deals or are looking to make those connections um, to anyone who are, you know, currently playing stadiums. And, you know, I work with business managers and then just the music industry professional community in general. So publicists, you know, A&R reps, publishers, um, you name it, if they're in the music community and they need a bank, um, then I work with them. So, yeah. I always tell people kind of the best way I describe my job is, you know, on one hand, banks are very highly regulated. And so we work very much in the world of black and white. Um, whereas the creative community is, what I like to say, all colors of the rainbow, some of which I think, you know, Crayola is yet to create their color yet, or they're the name of their color. And so it's my my job is to figure out how to make the world of color work within that world of black and white and so i'm kind of that mediator and translator between the two so i have to know and speak the banking language but i also have to know and speak the creative language and that music language and so i'm the one on the team who's kind of tra being that translator between those two worlds I love that color analogy. I wonder if, 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 if Crayola has plaid as a, as a color. The, uh, <laughs> the, the, I know, right? The first example I was ever really given, um, that I won't name names, about um, the entertainment banking and kind of how creative you all can get at times when you're trying to translate those colors into black and white um, really revolved around an artist who had gone viral very quickly and who started getting bookings but literally could not afford to get to the bookings. Um, mm -hmm. and, and this particular banker stepped in and assisted in that process. Um, and I believe you were on that team, actually. And, and I don't know if you remember who I'm talking about, but, but are there some specific instances like that that are like really actuary, like, okay, here was the problem that we had. Here's the solution we were able to come up with as the color to black and white as translator for for the institutional bankers absolutely i mean i think that the scenario that you just gave randall is really a very common solution you know it, it's one of those these opportunities you know I, i've seen it so many times where even when an artist gets signed to a record deal you know they have radio tour and they have different um events and bookings that are you know planned months out um, but most of them are not sitting on just this massive lump of cash, right, in their accounts. And so they have to get there. Even if it's something that's reimbursable by the label, it still has to go through the reimbursement process. And so a lot of times these artists are paying for items up front. And if they're not already sitting on you know, significant money that gets very expensive and very difficult to manage in addition to everyday living expenses. And so we will come in and, um, and work with the team, whether it's directly with the artist or the artist business manager. Um, and we will kind of evaluate what those needs are and then look at either getting a touring credit card or a touring line of credit, just depending on what, um, where they are in their career, what their projections look like. Um, so it doesn't necessarily always have to be, okay, well, we've made X amount of money in the past six months. It can also be looking at, you know, 
we're going on tour or we've got all of this revenue coming in, but it just hasn't been actualized yet from a royalty standpoint, et cetera. Um, another big example is, you know, you might have artists or songwriters who are starting to see significant success and are, you know, going to be receiving royalty income, but they need to buy a new vehicle or, you know, they wanted to buy a house. Their family is expanding and, you know, they need to provide a roof over their family's head. And so we know that the money is coming in. It just hasn't hit the account yet. It hasn't actually happened. And so, you know, we have specialty, specialized lending that can aid in, you know, helping them. Obviously, we still have to verify the income. We're still, again, in that black and white world. We're still very, you know, highly regulated and and fall into those regulations um, and want to do so from the protection of the bank and our clients. But um, we do have ways in understanding how their income, the ebbs and flows of their income um, happens in order to best serve those needs. Well, I imagine you all have formulas and all sorts of calculators where you can look at this song went number one on this day. So we're going to see the money start to come in six months down the road. And for our listeners, that's, that's how long it takes. Like it's, yeah. it, it's, you can be number one on the radio and still, you know, borrowing money to go get McDonald's for the first six months or so. And so, uh, so that's, that's really cool that, that you guys have that ability and that you guys, it seems like become a real advocate and partner for the creators um, to help them bridge that process between starving artist and and finally making it absolutely well and it's you know it, it's so important because you know we get to meet our clients where they are in their career um and i am just in a really unique position that i get to be a member of the team who you know is connected to the different areas of the music industry but i'm kind of that one person on the team that doesn't make commissions based on how well an artist does and so i get to kind of be that sounding board that um can really help guide or just like i said just kind of be a listening ear um because a lot of times clients know what they want to do but they just need someone who knows the players to be able to talk it out like i had one client who had two different publishing deals on the table and you know he just came in my office and said can we just talk through this he didn't want me to tell him which one to pick he just wanted someone who understood the business understood the players who could ask questions that he might not have thought about um so that he when he did ultimately make the decision he knew and was confident in the decision that he was making because, you know, that is that is a big decision. And who you surround yourself with really can lean to your success in, in this industry. Yeah, I imagine you all serve a similar position as attorneys in the business with regards to playing connector. 100%, you know, and we also are under privacy laws and so you know everything is, is confidential and it's it's kind of I wear a few different hats of financial advisor in certain um you know stints and a budget educator psychiatrist you know a counselor of sorts you know a connector you name it if the client needs it you know that's kind of the role that that I feel for sure or Tinder, whatever whatever they need right? absolutely just a or just a friend and a shoulder to cry on because you know there are definitely those moments in in this industry as well so like sighting highs and a few lows at times yeah, yeah. well with, with the privacy thing then I guess I can't ask you to name your favorite clients for us um <laughs> but in lieu of that Let's talk about the changes that we've seen in the industry and especially on the money side, because you've been privy to, to lots and lots of changes with regards to the financials of this business. 
Um, you know, what, what have you seen change the most over the past few years, um, in music with regards to, you know, banking and, and the financial side of things? Yeah. I mean, I think obviously there, there are certain restrictions. Um, of course, right now, interest rates play a huge factor and, um, certain approvals, right? Because, you know, what someone might have been approved for two years ago at a lesser rate, you know, they may not qualify for as much um, right now. Doesn't mean that they won't qualify for it. It's just, you kind of have to be a little bit more creative in that space to try to figure out exactly what their needs are and how to meet those needs. Um, you know, I mean, I think that, you know, specifically what I do, because I, I work a lot with the individuals. So I work directly a lot with the artists, the songwriters, um, the industry creatives versus, you know, I still do work on the catalog side and the royalty lending piece. Um, but, you know, from a, a personal perspective, just what those needs look like and figuring out the best way to meet those needs within the confines of, you know, banking regulations and restrictions um, has really been a, a big factor for us, especially coming off of COVID where a lot of these individuals, you know, weren't touring or the venues themselves, you know, the live event people, you know, like the booking agents, you know, their income, dropped significantly in the year 2020 um and even though 2021 we started seeing a rebound it wasn't necessarily back where they were in 2019 and so when you're still again dealing with those federal re regulations where you're typically looking at two years tax returns and things like that having to kind of be creative and understand that this was an anomaly. This is not how it's going to be going forward and figuring out the best way to meet those needs um, despite those facts. Well, you all were pretty integral with helping a lot of artists navigate the PPP loans, were you? We were, yes. That was not my most favorite time in history, if I'm being honest. <laughs> so, so helping them navigate the waters to try to figure out where, where they can find some. It was not, obviously, I love helping clients. And so it wasn't the helping of the clients. It was the actual PPP process itself. That was not necessarily the easiest. The rules kind of changed a few times. Um, and it just, you know, it, there was a lot of anxiety during that time for everyone, right? And, you know, for some being approved for the PPP loan really was, you know, a make or break kind of situation. It's what kept food on the table and helped provide for their family, not only their family, but also to the families of the individuals that worked for them. So these artists that, you know, have a team and have, you know, that they're responsible for, there was just a lot of pressure there. Um, for them and so just there's that a weight that comes with that and so knowing that you're helping them help themselves but or also you know if if it didn't get approved for whatever reason you know that that really could negatively impact their livelihood was very daunting at times no, but I'm, worth it i'm sure um yeah. with regards to your partnering and your lending practices um, this may come as an odd question, but we Symphonic is a is obviously a distribution company, and we are what we what we phrase the genre agnostic. We are not. I'm I am interested in working with successful independent musicians and labels, if it happens to be a jazz record or if it happens to be a hard rock record, it means very little to me because I place my value on the music, and I firmly believe there's no such thing as bad genres. I think there's bad music. But, but I've, I've found music in every single genre in the world that I love. So the question for you um, is, is do you take genre into consideration with your lending practices, et cetera? And I'll, I'll follow that up with, on our side, there's definite modeling that we've been able to see that some genres earn differently than others. 
depending on consumption habits of the consumer. Um, and so we've keyed in on that a little bit, um, mostly just for our internal kind of, um, you know, speculation about, about sales growth, et cetera. Do you all take that into consideration or is it just a matter of does it earn or does it already have, you know, bookings ahead that we can look at and model out a break even point on this line of credit? I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, I, I would agree with, with you, you know, I work with clients and all different uh, genres of music. Um, you know, obviously because I sit in Nashville, um, you know, I do work a ton in the country space, but, you know, as we both know, Nashville isn't just country music. And so, you know, as we're seeing the rise of other genres in Nashville, but also, you know, the flexibility of what I do is that, you know, I meet my clients where they are. And if that means they're not in Nashville, that's okay too. You know, I have clients all over the United States, um, some globally. Um, if it makes sense, then, you know, we, we definitely have a way of, of making that partnership work. Um, there is obviously a, an understanding and that's, you know, kind of why I do what I do in the sense that I show up to um, different conferences and different things to learn more about the um the items and the issues that my clients could be facing on a daily basis um whether it's country whether it's pop whether it's hip-hop etc um and so you know i need to understand their revenue streams and how they make money so that i can best be that translator and be that that spokesperson um for them from a banking perspective and that's you know a lot of people are like well i don't have anything going on carrie i'll come to you when i have my first single or i you know have my first number one etc but what i explain to people is that this is a relationship and obviously the longer i have a relationship with someone the more i know their story the easier it is for me to be able to speak on their behalf and so understanding what that world looks like for them. And I mean, we do obviously take into consideration certain models because there are, as you said, um, the income, you know, a number one song in country does not make nearly as much money as a number one song or even a top 10 song sometimes in pop, right? Um, and so, you know, we, we do look at those factors, but then sometimes it, it can be as cut and dry um, as what does their profit and loss statement or their balance sheet say? Who is the team around them, right? What do they have going on? Um, again, that projected income piece. Um, there are a lot of different factors. It's not your traditional banking of here's your credit score. I mean, yes, we look at credit. There are several things that we do look at that's the same, but, you know, we do look at it just a little bit differently through a different lens as we're making decisions. So artists pay your credit card bills on time. <laughs> yes, yes, please. <laughs> and if you don't and you need to talk about how to you know, repair credit. I'm obviously not a licensed debt consolidator or anything like that, but, you know, I can give some tips and, and tricks to kind of help, you know, and, and what can be done and what I've seen work throughout the years, um, you know, to, to help improve that so that, you know, as you're, as more things are going on and more money is coming in, you are in a position to make financial decisions for yourself that will, you know, really be impactful, um, both in the present, but then in the long run, right? Because that's the thing is a lot, unless you work on the traditional business side, right? You and I, we have 401ks, we have, you know, ways to invest. Um, but for a lot of artists, a lot of songwriters and a lot of, you know, independent contractors within the music community, 
that's just not their world. They don't have their employer taking out a certain percentage and then matching that. You know, their investments and their retirement income comes from, you know, the work that they're doing now. And, um, you know, being able to plan for that um, it is also important just being able to have someone that they can trust to kind of talk about what their current goals are, but also what their future hopes and dreams and what they would like to achieve um, is, is really important. And that's why I am here. With a smile. The, that's right. um, the, there's a word you keep saying, and I love it because it's, it's so easy to get lost in the numbers and this business and, and to only be about the bottom line, but you keep saying the word relationship. Mm-hmm. Right? I'm, I've known you long enough to know where that's coming from in your heart. Um, a lot of artists don't have the benefit of living in Nashville, New York, LA, or Miami. Um, and so the prevalence of entertainment banking may not be as as present in those communities. Is there any advice you could offer an artist that lives in in small town USA or 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 perhaps or an artist who lives in in Puerto Rico who's listening to this who wants to do this and wants to find a way to, to, to have a bank that can be their advocate and their friend and their ally. And so I think most people, most of us kind of banks are tolerated for most, most, most of the population. It's true. It is true. And, and like, it's a necessary evil that, you know, you, you're with them cause you like the website and cause you get like a, yeah, maybe, maybe free checking account or something. Right. Yeah. Um, for those who are privileged enough to live in these communities where you all are all, um, present. How does one establish that relationship and, or do you all work with out of state people who are looking to have an advocate who say, well, you know, I might be in Nashville twice a year. So maybe it makes sense to bank with someone there who is in the industry, who can help plug me in with a PRO if I want to change PROs or help, help me navigate that, that publishing deal like you were speaking of earlier. Yeah, absolutely. So as I was mentioning earlier, I mean, I have clients, you know, all over the country. Um, I have some clients in Canada and the UK. Um, so we definitely have some flexibility. Obviously, you know, banking has evolved um, even in the 13 years that I've been in Nashville. Um, I've been in, in finance for almost 20 years. Um you know, I, and I always joke and say the Lord has a great sense of humor because I have a political science history degree and hadn't really intended to get into the world of finance, but I'm very thankful that I did. Um, but I think it's one of those where, you know, I'm always happy to be a resource and have a conversation with anyone um, to see what makes sense. And, you know, there, there may be one of those situations where, you know, they it does make sense to have a nashville based bank and then sometimes it doesn't you know my advice would be is just you know get to know your local banker um you know that the the challenge that you'll have if you're not dealing with a music industry bank is you know i've spent 13 years of my life attending events and really in immersing myself and the music and creative community. Um, and so I understand, again, just those ebbs and flows of the income and the revenue. Um, and, you know, for a lot of banks going back to the regulation side and that black and white, a lot of them, it's very kind of dry. Let me see your pay stuff. I will see your last year's W-2. Let's take a look at your credit based on this metric. You qualify for X. Um, when in reality, the majority of the creative space, that's not what their income looks like. And, you know, and so being able to find someone that understands that, who can be a champion and an advocate for them within their local bank um, is doable, but it may not be 
as um, available as, you know, a music industry bank. And so to answer that, you know, I am I am happy to connect with whomever. And so she'll, please feel free to share my contact, you know, my email. Um, Be careful. <laughs> You know, I mean, but it's it's just one of those that I'm I'm happy to answer questions. You know, if if people have them, because um, you just you never know. And I think sometimes just ha- having someone that understands it that can just kind of provide a little bit of guidance um, is is definitely important. And you know, especially for those who are looking to potentially make that move um, to. Austin or Nashville or LA or New York or you know even Vegas um from a having someone in your corner from a banking perspective is just really important in my opinion I'm very biased I can acknowledge that but I do think you know having someone who who gets what you're doing in that world um definitely can help make a difference I couldn't agree more and I, and I do think, I think most major banks have some semblance of some sort of entertainment division, though I think a lot of them are more focused on the macro business and the multi-million dollar deals. And, and, and it's so refreshing to hear you come at this, um, you know, from the SVP title, from the ivory tower per se, with a focus on community which I think is really, really cool and, and, and maybe a vast differenti- differentiator for your bank and for you, um, which I think is really neat. Um, with regards to the business, the industry, we keep hearing about NFTs and about blockchain and about all of these other emerging technologies that we're trying to leverage and utilize within the industry. What has you most excited moving forward for the music industry? Not banking specifically, but but across the board. Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Um, you know, I mean, obviously the technology is evolving. And as someone who is not super technologically savvy, um it can be very daunting at times but it's also very exciting to be a part of this time in history um to see how things are going to land and how things are going to shape up um you know i mean we're it, we're not anywhere near there yet but just even having conversations within you know studio bank and, and with other colleagues who are well well versed in in that world about potentially lending against nfts just like we have in the past with catalogs and um you know or songs and you know it to me that gets very that's very exciting to be on uh the, the forefront of something you know being involved in um watching history change and getting to be a part of that and you know because a lot of the things that I do now was put in place you know by my predecessors and and, you know and so it's like now for me to get to be a part of that new wave of technology and figuring out what music banking needs to look like and what the industry looks like as a whole is just really exciting. Um, so I don't know if there's just one thing. I'm really excited to see where this new technology between AI and the NFT and crypto space lands for sure. Yeah, no, AI is is definitely something and I think all, everyone in the industry is keeping it. 100%. 100%. NFTs, you know, there, there are, I keep hearing these stories of these artists that are just blowing up on nfts and 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 doing yes. really, really well and i, I feel yes. in in some cases they're artists who don't stream that well and so it's very hard to, to see diversification um yeah. across that plane well and i think it's really exciting in the sense that you know i've had clients who have seen an incredible amount of revenue come in from NFTs and releasing their music through that avenue that it would have taken them 
a long time of playing, you know, the the local honky tonks or the writers rounds um, or, you know, smaller shows, which is kind of where they, they might fit right now um, or, you know, receiving royalty income and things like that for the songs that they're releasing via the DSPs. Um, and so that's really exciting to me to be able to watch them achieve their dreams through that avenue. Um, you know, obviously they're from a banking perspective comes some questions about tax implications and different ways to handle those funds because of how they get paid out. Um, but that presents a, a fun time for me to kind of figure, figure that out along with them and what that needs to look like and really help be, you know, that sounding board for them. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of opportunities to be had there. And um, for those who are figuring it out, they're seeing a, a nice uptick to their their income for sure. That's awesome. So only a couple more things to ask you here. Very, very important, hard hitting questions. Like, which band are you currently listening to that's your favorite band right now? It's gotta be current though. You can't be go you can't go into catalog. Don't tell me it's the Eagles. Who's your Okay? Who's your favorite current band right now? Well, I I love the Parmalee guys and I love the new music that they've been releasing. Um, and so you can definitely catch me singing along to them in my car. Well, you probably don't want to catch me singing along <laughs> in my car if I'm being honest, just because there's a reason I'm behind the scenes. Um when it comes to things, I'm not the best singer in the world, but uh, you wouldn't know it the way that I rock out to to their current music while I'm I'm driving around for sure. So Parmalee, it is. That's a great. That is a great. Band. Yeah, so fantastic. They're just great humans as well, and so it's always fun to to see good people do great things. Boy, you can say that again louder for the people in the back. Uh, Awesome. So if someone wants to get a hold of you or learn more about Studio Bank and what you all do, studiobank.com, I think, right? Studiobank.com. Yes. Okay. And, 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 and if, if, if you are going to be gracious with your email address, now would be the time when I'll let you um, espouse that so that our crowd can write that down feverishly and blow your inbox up. Absolutely. Well, they can also reach me at LinkedIn. So my name spelling is a little different. Um, it's Carrie.Barnhart at Studio Bank, um, but I spell my name K-A-R-I. Uh, so it's Carrie, K-A-R-I dot Barnhart, um, B-A-R-N-H-A-R-T at studiobank.com. So feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, you can shoot me a message on LinkedIn. I'm not really on a ton of socials, so... I'm kind of one of those weird people that have, you know, I and I enjoy the freedom of not being attached to different social media apps all the time. So I would definitely shoot me an email or uh, hit me up on LinkedIn, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Well, and how how kind of you to offer that direct contact up? I think this is a first for the Music Industry 360 podcast that we have actual actual contact details and uh, and so i do appreciate you sharing that and i appreciate you being here with us today carrie and sharing all of, all of your vast knowledge in this space um that about wraps us up everyone thank you for listening once again my name is randall foster this is music industry 360 podcast brought to you by symphonic and we appreciate you being being here stick around for more we've got great episodes coming up as well and you can explore our website and find those episodes for your own listening pleasure thank you so much goodbye <laughs>